Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to start off talking about some of the architecture behind React Native and how the multi-threading and the different performance bottlenecks uh, work. Uh, this will give you some of the foundation for some of the content that we're going to cover uh, in the later sessions today. So React Native uh, has a bridge between JavaScript and Native. And on both sides of the bridge, there can be performance bottlenecks. And also, the bridge itself can have performance bottlenecks. So in this talk, I'm going to explain to you some of the bottlenecks on the JavaScript side of the bridge, but also some of the bottlenecks in the bridge itself. Some of the JavaScript bottlenecks include uh, uh, slow JavaScript. And we can solve these uh, using a couple of techniques. Um, one is called Interaction Manager. Another is called Request Idle Callback. And the third is React Fiber. Uh, you may have heard of some of these terms before. Uh, and then in the bridge, uh, a source of bottlenecks and also a source of debugging these bottlenecks is what's called the message queue. So we'll talk about that as well. Uh, JavaScript bottlenecks. Uh, are really all about JavaScript that takes too long to execute. And what is too long? Well, we sometimes care about how much time it takes for JavaScript to render the next frame that the user is going to see. For animations, the user is going to see the next frame and be very, very sensitive to when the next frame appears. So one approach that many people use in uh, the browser, but also React Native, is to compute the coordinates of each uh, item that's being animated. So every single frame, 16 milliseconds, the coordinates of some div in the browser or a view in React Native get updated. And that needs to happen at a very smooth frame rate for it to appear at 60 FPS. So for animations, we care about rendering the next frame under 16 milliseconds. Sometimes when people uh, build apps, they also don't have as sensitive of a performance need. For instance, if you have a button in your app and someone taps the button and something happens in response to that tap, it doesn't have to happen right away in under 16 milliseconds. It's usually OK for that to happen in under 50 milliseconds. For some people, they don't notice if it happens in under 100 milliseconds. So we have a looser performance need. And if your content um, that you're trying to render is off screen, for instance, with the navigation components that Brent showed yesterday, uh, we had multiple screens. And if the screen that is not currently being displayed has some animation, or maybe it fetched some data and received the network response and now is trying to update the screen in response to that data, it doesn't need to update right away because the user can't even see that screen. So we want to re render that at a low priority. Um, part of the reason why JavaScript can take a long time in React Native uh, is, oh, well, there are a couple of reasons. So one is too much React rendering. This is a concept that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, if you have large uh, component hierarchies, then rendering the root component over and over can incur a lot of work, and that takes time, usually over 16 milliseconds. Uh, with React, uh, some of the approaches you can take to avoid this are uh, things like implementing should component update or uh, just trying to minimize the amount of rendering, so calling set state on more of a leaf node component rather than a root node component. Also, just calling json.parse on a very large string that you receive from the server or from your local data store, that can sometimes take a significant amount of time. Maybe it's not over 16 milliseconds, but let's say it's three, four milliseconds. Now you've taken that time out of your budget, your 16 millisecond budget, to render at 60 FPS. Also, full garbage collection passes can also take significant time, sometimes 10 milliseconds, sometimes longer. This is something that you don't have as much control over, so we want the architecture of React Native to allow the performance of the, the JavaScript garbage collector not to affect the performance of your native views. One of the first approaches we can use in JavaScript to address the JS bottlenecks is an API in React Native called Interaction Manager. Interaction Manager is a form of cooperative scheduling. That means that different pieces of code need to cooperate to schedule uh, very efficiently. Interaction Manager has two sides of its API. The first side, which is something that you may use, is uh, deferring your callback. 
and you call interaction manager dot run after interactions and pass a callback. It's kind of similar to a request animation frame if you use that, uh, except it doesn't run your callback until all the other code in your app says there are no more interactions. This is useful in um, touch gesture handling. I'll get to that in a couple seconds. Um, because the second half of the Interaction Manager API is to announce that you are going to begin an interaction. Uh, typically, you will not call this yourself. Uh, this is used by React Native internals like PanResponder, which is a library for doing gestures. So PanResponder will say, I'm starting an interaction. And then if you call Interaction Manager run after interactions, while the pan responder is active, your callback will not run. And this is what keeps that gesture really smooth. So even if your callback is slow, it's not going to interrupt anything because it's not running. And when the pan gesture completes, then your callback will be invoked. So a couple of problems with Interaction Manager are that we don't know how much of time is remaining in a frame. Uh, if you get your callback invoked, you don't know whether that frame has 16 milliseconds left or two milliseconds left. Uh, you also need to manually write all of this code to say run after interactions. It's a very manual process. And there's no notion of priorities, like high priority or low priority work. Uh, as I alluded to in the previous slide, with animations uh, having the 16 millisecond need, whereas responding to buttons maybe a 50 millisecond need. So another API uh, in React Native that solves some of these problems is called request idle callback. This is actually implemented in React Native by Brent. Uh, and it was uh, an API that is similar to request animation frame. The idea is you pass in a callback uh, to request dial a callback, and your callback will be invoked when React Native says it has free time to render a frame. So if it's not doing any work during a frame, maybe you aren't calling set state, you're just not doing anything, uh, but you've scheduled an idle callback, you'll be notified. Uh, that React Native has 16 milliseconds available for you to do computation. And you can uh, repeatedly query React Native and ask, how much time remaining do I have in this frame? So it'll tell you maybe you only have eight milliseconds left in that frame. And this allows you to adjust how much work you perform in that frame. Uh, it's also uh, supported in browsers as well, uh, modern browsers. So you can write libraries that call into request at all callback, and they will work in both React Native and also the DOM. A third approach uh, that solves a lot of these performance problems is React Fiber. Uh, this is still a project that is not uh, complete yet. It's just getting started. You may have heard of it. Um, one of the things that React Fiber does is it divides the rendering work of React into smaller chunks that are scheduled across frames. So if you have a large component hierarchy that takes more than 16 milliseconds to render, React Fiber will use request idle callback to divide up the amount of work uh, done per frame. And this allows you to uh, achieve, say, more responsive interactions. Because if you had a very complex screen in your application, uh, React Fiber would divide the work of that complex screen across multiple frames. And that allows uh, your app to also respond to touch events, for instance, uh, in the middle of the rendering of that complex screen. Um, React Fiber still isn't perfect, though. It doesn't help with non-React code. Uh, we could maybe adjust that by uh, having the Fiber scheduler be a public API. This is something that uh, is still uh, totally up in the air, and I think will be a topic of discussion over the next one to two years. So keep an eye on this. The bridge is the piece in React Native that sits between the JavaScript and the native side. So this is the last category of bottlenecks that I'm going to talk about. And it's generally pretty simple. Uh, you're doing too much work over the bridge if your bridge is the bottleneck. Uh, and that can be because there are too many bridge messages or your messages are too large. Uh, there's also a, another problem with latency, but this happens only in development environments and won't affect your production applications uh, with a remote debugger. The React Native bridge sends messages between JavaScript and native. So in this uh, slide on the, the bottom, I have some uh, examples that kind of look like code. Uh, but these are actually bridge commands being sent from JavaScript to native. That's why it says JS to N and N to JS, native to JavaScript. This is how a lot of React Native works. 
So when you create a view in your React JavaScript, that gets translated in JavaScript to this bridge message, UIManager.createView. And it has some information. You can see in that bridge message, uh, type of the view is RCT view. Uh, we wanted to put the style position absolute. You can imagine for more complex views, there are more uh, fields in this message. So all the view rendering that happens in React goes through a message queue and sends messages like this. And also, likewise, when uh, the JavaScript asks for a result from native, maybe we wanted to do a network request, or maybe we wanted to ask for the user's geolocation. That information is sent back from native to JavaScript using the uh, same bridge, just in the other direction. One API that you can use to look at all these messages, it's actually quite informational, so I recommend trying it out when you're more comfortable with React Native, is to call messageq.spy. Now, messageq uh, is not uh, publicly exported by React Native. It's sort of a semi-public, semi-private API, and the way you require it is you have to say uh, import message queue with no curly braces from React Native slash library slash batched bridge slash message queue. Uh, I don't expect you to remember that, but if you just search online for React Native message queue spy, you'll find a couple of libraries or articles on how to do this. Message queue.spy takes in a callback function that is kind of like uh, your own version of console.log. Imagine if you were implementing console.log and you wanted to receive all these uh, log messages. Well, that's sort of what messageq.spy allows you to pass in. So your function that you pass in to messageq.spy receives all of these uh, message queue entries. And you can decide to filter some of them out or print them however you like. But this gives you a lot of insight into what the message queue is doing. Message queue.spy also, just for convenience, can take a Boolean. Uh, if you pass in true, it enables a default log function, which just logs every single message. And if you pass in false, it will turn off that log function. This is a great uh, technique to see what messages are being passed over the message queue. So if you are doing something very inefficient in your application, for example, uh, passing very, very large amounts of data, like megabytes of data over the bridge, this is one way to uh, detect that, because you could add a custom message spy function and uh, search to see if the, just write a filter to see if the message is over a certain length. Or you could uh, count the number of messages sent per second, and if it is too high, uh, you would maybe display a warning in development mode. So message queue.spy allows you to uh, diagnose performance problems with the bridge. Uh, lastly, there's message queue latency. This generally isn't a problem when you are uh, not using the remote debugger with React Native or, of course, in production mode because there is no debugger. But the way the remote debugger works in React Native is it runs your JavaScript not on your, or not on your phone at all. Uh, it actually launches Chrome, sends the JavaScript of your application to Chrome, Chrome runs the JavaScript, and then sends commands over the message queue to your actual device. Uh, this, of course, is going between two different devices, your computer and your phone. Uh, if they are on the same network, uh, it's faster than if they are going over the internet, but it's still slower than what's happening in production on your device, where the, uh, the native component and the JavaScript engine are on the same device in the same process, which is just much more efficient. So whenever you enable the remote debugger, there is more latency in the message queue, and this could be a source of slowness. Um, again, this only affects uh, when you have that remote debugger on. Uh, so please don't try to profile performance with a remote debugger enabled. And you will see right away that a lot of uh, JS-driven animations, or maybe the responsiveness of your application will drop when you enable the remote debugger. So that sort of sums up the problems uh, with performance in React Native. Uh, we've actually solved a lot of these problems uh, with things like uh, request idle callback and message queue.spy allows you to diagnose problems uh, more quickly, but we haven't fixed all the problems, which is why projects like React Fiber are currently underway. We also can combine some of these uh, techniques at solving problems. 
Uh, React Fiber, for instance, allows us to write applications that re are very responsive, respond quickly uh, to touch events, for instance, even if complex hierarchies are being rendered. And then when we respond quickly to an event, we want to make sure that if we perform some animation, it uh, runs very smoothly. So we have this technique called native animated, which actually runs none of the uh, animation in JavaScript except for the first initial bit. Uh, that's a topic that uh, Brent will talk about later today, and uh, I, I hope you enjoy the rest of today's session. Thanks. Thank you.